We are here with Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Kahn. Uh, Jennifer is a professor in the School of Public Health and Seamus is a professor in the Department of Sociology. And they have written a book. You have written a book called Sexual Citizens. Uh, it is uh, based on research that was done here, Jennifer led, uh, that arose out of the context of uh, public attention uh, a few years ago to the problem uh, of sexual assault on campus. And as we were <clears throat> at this institution, uh, really trying to focus on this in new ways, with something that we have always focused on, but when something arises, it's very controversial, uh, we should always be the first to jump in and say, what can we do better? And that was the spirit in which we were uh, approaching this. And as we did that, what could we do? What is the nature of the problem? We realized that there had been very little research on this. And so, since we're an institution that does scholarship and teaching, it seemed to make sense that we would really invest in, in that kind of research. And out of that came uh, the work, uh, and uh, that basic work led to your book, Sexual Citizens. Uh, and so that's what we're here to talk about. Yeah, so the book draws uh, primarily on the ethnographic research that we did um, immersed with a team of seven researchers in undergraduates' day-to-day -day lives. Um, so there's been a lot of survey research. We know that sexual assault has been, for four decades, there's you know an enormous amount of work showing that um, rates of sexual assault have not changed. And so yeah. the question that we brought to the research was, how, what would it look like to think about sexual assault as a public health problem? Um, how can we move upstream and um, think about a new vision of prevention? And that's what the book does, is it brings forward a new way of thinking about uh, sexual assault prevention. Define the words ethnographic research. So ethnographic research is um, involves being immersed in we were not immersed, but our team of yeah. younger and uh, later at night uh, researchers were involved, yeah. uh, immersed in students' social lives, riding the bus up to the athletic fields, going to Hillel, yes. um, and then talking with them. We interviewed them, we did yeah. focus groups. So ethnographic research um, gets very near to the experience that yeah. people have. And Seamus, from the, from the sociology standpoint, looking at be human behavior and trying to understand it in a deep way, uh, using this kind of research is very much consistent with your professional, with your discipline, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, Jennifer had this really profound idea, which was, you know, what if we think about sexual assault in the ways that we think about clean water? Yeah. Um, and this idea is that, you know, it's hard to get every single person yeah. to clean their water. Yeah. But we might think about developing clean water systems so yeah. that people just open the tap and the water comes out clean. And so, you know, part of this idea that Jennifer brought, I think, was what's the clean water solution to sexual assault? How do we create mm -hmm. ecologies and campus contexts and really beyond the campus, mm -hmm. you know, broad social contexts where people, we don't have to mandate people's behaviors all the time. Instead, we create sort of structures that help this happen. And there's something very sociological as well about that kind yeah, of approach. Very interesting. Who were these people who we sent out? Mm -hmm. What do they do in more detail? Uh, why should we rely on their stories? So a lot of student social life happens after Seamus and I are asleep. Yeah. And so it had to be people who had the stamina to stay up much later right. and to be younger so that it wouldn't be weird and awkward for them to be socializing with students. Um, they were uh, sort of masters or doctoral level trained social science and or public health yeah. uh, people, diverse in a way that um, prepared them well to engage with the full breadth of the undergraduate. You know, Columbia has a very yeah. diverse undergraduate population and we wanted yeah. to reach all corners of it. Um, and uh, they they were extraordinary. I don't know what yeah. else to say, except that they worked right. with intense dedication over three semesters. Well, what did they do? They, they walk up to a group and say, you're going to a bar tonight. <laughs> I would love to follow, uh, be part of your group. Or? So I think part of the genius of SHIFT was our collaboration with the Undergraduate Advisory Board. We had a group of undergraduates yeah. who um, 
we paid yeah. to work with us as our advisors. Again, yeah. people are experts in their own lives. And yeah. so we met with them every Monday morning at 8 a.m. Yeah. for the duration of the project. Yeah. And they guided us. So they helped us map out the kinds of spaces and in some cases made introductions of the ethnographers to those spaces. So it was never just walking in cold. Yeah. And it was also, and I think this is important, because um, this is the thing that people wonder about, is it was never spying. Yes, so right. they were always introduced and welcomed into social spaces. Right. So we had two groups here. We had an undergraduate advisory group. Mm -hmm. They were paid to be part of this and to help us to organize this kind of study of, of their behavior. And then we had some master's students, graduate students, who could have the stamina to stay up past 10 o'clock <laughs> and, uh, and who would mingle easily into this group. And, and with that information, we then got what? So, I mean, they, you know, they, they really became friends with a lot of these students, very close with them. They're yeah. hanging out in fraternities, playing Settlers of Catan. Um, you know, they're hanging out in dorm rooms, cooking dinner with people. And in addition, we did interviews with 150 students yeah. that were each about two hours long. And what we learned was sort of really a rich portrait of student lives that go well beyond sexual assault. Yeah. So we came to understand what it meant to be a college student today, yeah. um, how sex and sexuality fit into yeah. the experience of being a college student today, yeah. and why sexual assault tends to be such a common feature for almost all college students. Yeah. I mean, it's, in, it's in, incredibly common. and. Yeah sort of having this broad perspective where we didn't just look at assault, but instead we wanted a kind of holistic portrait of student life today. Yeah. And then to take that portrait and try and see why it was that people experienced assault in a community where, you know, students really do care for one another and yeah. students really do think that what's happening is wrong and they want to see improvements. And yeah. so kind of having that total picture allowed us to have a clearer sense of what was happening. And this, what emerges is a picture, a lens, into the lives, and in particular, the sexual lives of young people today. Okay, what do you find? I mean, one thing we found is that this has been a problem, campus sexual assault, assault that people have thought of as the responsibility of higher education to address. Yeah. And yes, and, yeah. because, um, it's really a problem that society needs to address. We found in the survey that um, a quarter of the women uh, who participated in our survey had been assaulted before coming to campus. Yeah. So um, already it's a little late. People show up at campus with complicated yeah. lives. And so um, in the book, we cast a much broader lens on who is responsible. And yeah. so it's families and communities and faith organizations, if we, like this is a problem that we can solve, yeah. but not just in higher education. We think that, you know, college, college and university settings have a lot that they can do to help, but in some ways it's too late. Um, uh, I guess it's never too late, but it, yeah. in some ways it, it, it needs to be a kind of booster, not the first time that people are introduced to these concepts. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Jennifer and I develop a kind of a language for thinking through what it is um, that we should be teaching young people. Um, and that language is a sense of sexual citizenship, which is the title of the book, Sexual yeah. Citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, developing Jennifer's earlier work, um, talking to young people about what they want out of their sexual lives or their sexual projects, and taking space really seriously as a dimension that's important for creating sexual situations, but that is also important for explaining sexual assault. Uh, physical space? Physical space. We mean things like, if you think for a moment about two young people who are hanging out, say, in an e one evening and they go back to somebody's room, typically there are four pieces of furniture in that room, a desk, a chair, a bureau, and a bed. Mm -hmm. Where are they going to sit? Mm -hmm. If they're going to sit together, they're going to sit on a bed. Mm -hmm. And beds have social meaning. And it, it may not, it shouldn't be a natural consequence that people end up having um, a sexual interaction because of that, but it makes it much more likely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so thinking about the spaces that are available to young people on ca campus and how mm -hmm. we could redesign them and open them up to create other possibilities for interaction mm -hmm. is really important. Could we explore a little bit this um, high percentage of women who have been assaulted before they arrive 
at college and how that's a predictor of um, having another assault. Um, what happens, uh, you know, in that pre-college years that, um, that, that really also needs to be addressed? I mean, one thing that doesn't happen yeah. for everyone is comprehensive sexuality education. Yeah. We were really astonished. Um, you know, these are students, I don't have to tell you how hard they work to prepare to get into college. Yeah. And they haven't um, had the benefit of that same level of preparation yeah. for sex. If you think about the the kinds of efforts that parents and communities make to teach young people how to drive so yeah. that they can move two-ton vehicles safely throughout the world without killing someone. Yeah. Um, you know, there's road design and there's driver's ed and there's, there's right. car design and there's a total lack of a sort of uh, equivalent social effort for preparing young people to become sexual. Yeah, yeah. And so they figure it out on their own. And it's a little yeah. bit like if you learn to drive from watching car crash videos, <laughs> yeah. like that's pretty much learning about sex from porn. Yeah, that's what yeah, it's like. Yeah. I think, you know, if if one just said, what what is the common understanding of what's going on here? I think many people would say drinking is a major cause and you have to cut back on, on uh, student drinking. And I wonder what you think about that kind of explanation. Uh, I think another one is uh, that men just need to control their impulses more and we need to punish people severely if uh, men, if they do this. And so I've been in many conversations with people who uh, you know, that's their take on, on this. So just starting just with the alcohol, yeah. um, a couple of points. Um, certainly there are many sexual assaults that are associated with alcohol, yeah. but um, remembering that the ethnography was only one part of the broader shift research project. And so there were, there was also um, uh, two forms of survey research. And so that in the, we can contextualize what we found in the ethnography through reference to um, survey and so we know from the survey mm -hmm. that um, about half of the assaults that students experience were not associated with alcohol. Yeah, interesting. And because students of color tend to drink less, yeah. um, a focus on alcohol-associated assaults and that and preventing those yeah. really underserves other students. So I think thinking about sexual yeah, assault um, as a set of outcomes rather than yeah. one outcome that's going to have one effective prevention strategy yeah. is important. And then the other point that we would make about alcohol is that um, students don't just drink and then happen to have sex. They yeah. frequently drink as part of an evening that is going to involve sex. And yeah. so it's like they go together like chocolate and peanut butter in right. students' eyes. And yeah, so right. I think telling students I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to a bar in your life, but adults <laughs> yeah. also frequently combine yeah. alcohol and sex. And so yeah. I think telling students just not to drink and have sex yeah. is sort of unrelated to right. the many reasons, anxiety, um, shame, fun. Yeah. So I think thinking about how we can make those interactions safer yeah. as opposed to how we can stop them from happening. Yeah. happening. Yeah. And in terms of, you know, I, I think there's sort of other explanations like, you know, men um, and the pathology of men. You know, one of, one of the things that we really argue, you know, we, we, foc we argue that we sort of focus too much on the idea of a perpetrator or the idea yes. of a sociopath. Yeah. Um, the vast majority of people who are assaulted are assaulted by somebody they know. Yeah. Often someone that they've had previous sexual contact with. Yeah. And so if we are training young people to look for sociopaths as the real risk, yeah. they're often going to be looking for things that are less common as yeah. a form of assault. And so, you know, we we have a lot of stories in the book mm -hmm. about young men who, you know, in some cases have these sort of very touching and beautiful accounts of their relationships that they've been in for long periods of time, but then also tell us about instances where they committed an assault. Yeah. And, you know, in raising this with students, um, you know, they, they're they hungry for these conversations. Yeah. And it's not about having a super sex positive approach to the world where we're, you know, talking about the joys and importance of sex. Instead, it's asking, if you want to live a good and fulfilling life, yeah. how is sex going to fit within that? Yeah. And sex is often the ways in which people connect to the, those that they're closest with. Yeah. And so 
one of the concepts of the book, this idea of a sexual project. What is it that sex is for for young people? We think that coming out of high school and certainly coming out of a university setting, students should be able to answer that question. Yeah. They should be able to say, for me, this is what sex is for. And if they can answer that question, we think that sexual assault would be far less likely to happen. I'm so impressed by uh, the work and the ways in which you present this. Seamus Khan, Jennifer Hirsch, thank you very much. Yeah.